We have so many uh, hopes for this wonderful first session of the day. I think uh, you're in for a real treat. Um, initially, we had thought we'd put the, the speakers on that side of the room such that you could just, just take in the sea uh, in case I start getting boring. But uh, it turns out that the, the videos are better this way. So uh, enjoy the, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the drab uh, beige uh, this morning. Um, thank you for coming. Faith Angle's been around for uh, 24 years. This is our 44th forum. They're always kind of like this. We have, I think, more brand new journalists this time than we've ever had before. Uh, so thank you for, for honoring us and taking a risk on something uh, new and different. Um, this first session uh, pairs, I think, a, sort of a, a sociologist analyst, an academic, uh, and a practitioner who's uh, in, in the fight in the space of, of entrepreneurial life in Silicon Valley. And I hope it's going to be really interesting. Basically, this book that uh, Carolyn wrote is called uh, Work, Pray, Code, not You Pray, Love, Work, Pray, Code. Uh, and it talks about how work has replaced religion um, in, the, in the valley, uh, that sort of swelling role of work. And as I was reading the book, and I did read this book, um, you know, it reminds me a lot about journalism uh, and how significant a place it plays in people's lives. It reminds me a bit about politics in Washington, where you, know, you come to DC and it, it's everything. Um, and work gets, or excuse me, religion tends to get crowded out. Uh, so this is a conversation about uh, the crowding out that sometimes happens. Um, the late Tim Keller, who just died, um, had this wonderful line. He said, you know, you know my people in New York, they're, they're on political Twitter uh, maybe eight hours a day, nine hours a day, 10 hours a day, or, or just at least in the MSNBC or Fox, whatever your, whatever your team. Uh, and I am, they're only at my church one or two hours a week. Uh, so how do, how do we really kind of compete with that, sort of the swelling place of, of technology in our lives? Um, uh, anyway, uh, uh, there's a lot that could be said about uh, these new friends. Um, let's hear it directly from them and just give you quickly their bios. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Chen is a, a sociologist professor of eth ethnic studies at UC Berkeley, where she co-directs the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion. And she's the executive director of the Asian Pacific American Religious uh, Research Initiative. Uh, she focuses on religion, spirituality, and work in contemporary America, with a particular focus on Asian American uh, religion. This book um, uh, from Princeton in 2022 uh, has, has done very well. She's done two others uh, called Getting Saved in America about Taiwanese uh, immigration and religious experience, and another one on uh, race and religion and ethnicity among Latino and Asian American second generation families from NYU in 2012. And she's published, like a lot of you, in the room at places like New York Times and The Atlantic and CNN and the Los Angeles Times. Um, Trey Stevens is a partner at Founders Fund, uh, where he invests across multiple sectors and multiple stages for different initiatives. He's also the co-founder and executive chairman of Anduril Industries, a defense technology company that's focused on autonomous systems. He's also the co-founder of Soul, which is a new way we're all going to be reading uh, uh, books and pieces, as I understand it, in the months to come. Um, previously, Trey was an early employee at Palantir Technologies, led teams focused on the intel space, defense space, as well as international expansion, uh, and thinking through uh, data analysis sets and problems. He was a prof at Georgetown uh, University. And prior to Palantir, uh, Trey worked as a, a computational linguist uh, in the intel community. Um, he also uh, worked for Rob Portman, then a congressman, uh, now a senator, of course, uh, and the Public Affairs Office at the Embassy in Afghanistan. I uh, graduated from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, um, and I know he's thought very carefully about all these things. And basically, our idea is, what's going on in Silicon Valley? How's work and religion changing? First, from Carolyn, we'll hear for about 25 minutes. And then, sort of being in the space, do people mostly just give up on religion, or are there some who are uh, sort of still in the fight? And as you're thinking about the questions of voc vocation and meaning and purpose, um, you know, are there some people who are uh, engaged in that common work together in, in congregations and in, in vocational life uh, itself? Uh, so I think you're in for a treat. I can't wait. Thank you for coming. Carolyn, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, thank you for this invitation to be here. And thank you, Nicole, for helping to organize this event. Um, and um, it's, it's really a pleasure and honor for me to be here talking to all of you. Um, when we teach our um, classes, so I'm a sociologist, and when we teach our, teach our methods class in sociology, we always ask this question to our students. 
is sociology just slow journalism? And uh, you know, and, and and when I've worked with journalists, I'm like I I'm amazed by the pace of which you you all write and have to produce because we're literally about a hundred times slower than you um, in coming out with information so, so much slower than you. Anyways, pleasure to be here. So um, as Josh uh, mentioned, my book is called Work, Pray, Code. I still have to look at the title because I always get the three words mixed up, right? So Work, Pray, Code, When Work Becomes Religion in Silicon Valley. And my basic argument is that work is replacing religion in Silicon Valley. But this book is not just about Silicon Valley. Um, I hope that this will become you know, what I'm talking about will help you also think about the place of work and religion. It, the, the, this argument is generalizable. Um, and, I, and I say to um, what I call knowledge industry hubs. So these are places like, not just like Silicon Valley, but Seattle, New York, Los Angeles, Washington, DC, Cambridge, these places that have really, where you see a high concentration of knowledge industry workers, these cities that really have grown in, I would say, the last 50 years um, and have experienced the largest population growth in the last 50 years as well. So let me first start off with how I got into studying Silicon Valley as a sociologist of religion. Like most scholars of religion, um, I study religious things, people, places that identify with a formal religious tradition, right? Um, but I became interested, I, I got into this topic because I started, as many of you know, have noticed, that the fastest growing religious group is actually religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, right? So the people who don't affiliate with any religious tradition at all. And you see that growth the fastest among in these so sort of coastal metropolitan areas. And so I was really curious about, well, as a sociologist of religion, how do I study religion and spirituality among this group? So I first started this project by looking at uh, yoga, and I was studying yoga, yoga practitioners, and I was conducting ethnography in yoga studios. And um, I interviewed yoga practitioners, and I asked them why they practice yoga, how they practice yoga, when they practice yoga. Um, and they would tell me, well, I like to practice yoga after a long day of work, and it helps me to distress, it helps me to stretch, it helps me to you know, calm myself down, and it makes me a better attorney, teacher, uh, you know, um, a programmer, lawyer, et cetera. You could fill in the blank with whatever profession they were talking about. And it became clear to me as I was talking to them, they would tell me about how they were willing to suffer headaches, broken relationships, anxiety attacks, depression, bodily ailments, all because of work. Now, as a sociologist of religion, I'm thinking, well, what is sacred here then? Because I had gone in thinking, well, yoga as this quasi-religious slash secular practice, right, that has religious origins, maybe this is what's secular. This is, but in fact, if you, you know, the more that I would spend time with these people, it was clear to me that they were surrendering, submitting, and sacrificing their lives to their work. And so it occurred to me, well, look, I need, I'm looking in the wrong place. You know, I need to, if I define what is religious by what is secular, I mean, sorry, by what is sacred, then I think I need to start looking at the workplace. So fast forward, um, it was sort of just a, a it, it was like, it, it was a random occurrence that my husband and I got fellowships at Stanford, so we moved to Palo Alto for the year. And there I was in Silicon Valley, the belly of the beast of 21st century capitalism, and wanting to study, you know, study workplaces and spirituality. So when I got there, um, I, um, I'm an ethnographer and I uh, immerse myself in the field, probably very similar to what you all do as journalists, except I spend a lot, years, <laughs> a lot more time there. And as I was interested, as I was, um, uh, as I was interviewing um, tech workers, I noticed a really interesting pattern when it came to religion. 
Um, and because, you know, most people who are studying Silicon Valley aren't looking at religion and spirituality, right? I, I came in with the eye of a, of, as, as, of a religion scholar. I noticed, well, first of all, let me just back up here, is that no one from Silicon Valley is really from Silicon Valley. Everyone moves there from somewhere else. So in my book, I call people, folks from Silicon Valley, tech migrants. Um, and I, in my former books, I studied immigration and religion. And one thing that I noticed is that people change their religion when they immigrate often. Religion changes in some way. And so what I noticed among what I call tech migrants, tech workers, is that they often lost their religion after they moved to Silicon Valley and started working in, uh, in tech companies. And most of these people were young men who often came from, I mean, they're coming right from places like China and Korea and Germany, but the majority of them are coming from places like Georgia, Oklahoma, upstate New York, these places that are more, uh, much more religious than the Bay Area. And an example of one of the people I talk about in my book is someone that I call John Ashton. Um, John Ashton came from Georgia, grew up in the church, was always really active in his church youth group. Um, he became the president of his Christian fraternity at Georgia Tech, you know, was really active, played in the church band when he worked in Atlanta. But then when he started working in Silicon Valley, he, 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 he left the church, he lost his faith. And it wasn't because it was some kind of like crisis in faith. And I think that that's one of the things that you, know, you need to understand is that I think for very few people, it's about a crisis of faith. Rather, it was just that it slowly kind of faded away because it wasn't important to him anymore. The institution of religion wasn't important to him anymore. And part of that was because he worked so much. He worked really long hours, and he told me he just didn't have time to go to church any, anymore. But as I started talking to him more and more, I realized actually that, wait, something else was going on. His startup had replaced his church in all the ways, all the ways that the, what his religion had at one time provided for him. It was now his tech company that was doing that. So it provided him with a strong sense of identity. It, um, and you know, as you know, in Silicon Valley, people always have like, they're wearing their sweatshirt or their t-shirt or it's like on their you know, water bottle, right? Um, and it's like, this is where I'm from. Um, and people go by the names of people, some people go by the names of their companies. Like that's, that's their sense of identity. It provided a really strong sense of belonging. It provided a really strong sense of purpose for him anymore um, now. So it wasn't that it was to, it wasn't his, um, his purpose in life wasn't, was now to transform the world, you know, one user at a time. He even <laughs> described to me the, um, this, the, the mission um, that he now had. He used it using this Christian missionary language. And he said to me, he kept on saying to me, you know, we just have this burden to come up with this thing that's going to change the world. You know, he kept on saying that. We just have this burden to come up with this thing to change the world. It also required faith in the way that religion does. The most, probably the most common phrase mantra that I heard over and over again in Silicon Valley is, well, you got to drink the Kool-Aid, you know? And laced in there is obviously this, this, this element of this consciousness that, you know, there is like, we need to give something up to follow, <laughs> you know, that, that there is this element of faith there, right? Um, because only one out of startups succeed. Um, I have to say, I, I wasn't sure if people got the, uh, the Jonestown um, metaphor <laughs> when they used that. So, um, but, but it was, you know, really ironic there, right? Um, the other thing is that companies provided this, so they provide meaning, purpose, belonging, identity, and also spiritual practices. Um, many people that I interviewed, they learned meditation and mindfulness uh, and also, you know, secular Buddhism and secular Buddhist practices and ideas through their companies. So this led me to this observation that the main argument of my book, that work was replacing religion in Silicon Valley. 
And what I mean by this is, you know, if I take this apart in two ways, is that first, that tech workers are looking to work for identity, meaning, belonging, and purpose. These are needs that Americans once fulfilled through their religious and civic institutions. Um, and then the second part of this is that companies are increasingly taking on pastoral roles where they are using spirituality and spiritual practices to grow the value of the human capital of their employees. So, um, and companies know that they benefit when they, when employees align the deepest parts of themselves with their work. So I saw this in, for instance, companies offering meditation and mindful class, mindfulness classes. And of course, this isn't just Silicon Valley anymore, right? This is almost so many organizations. Um, companies were offering spiritual retreats, like a, you know, a five-day silent retreat as a wellness benefit. Um, companies hired spiritual leaders like uh, Deepak Chopra to come in and give inspirational talks. Um, many, um, most senior leaders in Silicon Valley have executive um, coaches, and I spent time with executive coaches. I went to their training sessions, and they're deeply, deeply spiritual um, and have a lot of, um, particularly draw, drawing a lot from Asian religions, <laughs> particularly Buddhism. Um, when I talk to HR uh, um, managers and uh, professionals, and I asked them to describe their work and what they were doing in their companies, they would use words like, I'm nurturing the souls of the employees at, you know, fill in the black, blank, you know, Facebook, Google, et cetera, or I'm bringing wholeness to the workplace. So they saw themselves also as feeding and nurturing the spirituality of their workers. One, um, one executive that I interviewed told me, workplace, he, he said this to me, the workplace is the hotbed of spirituality in Silicon Valley. Um, another um, f f founder and CEO of a startup told me that he was the head pastor of his company. Um, so they really, so the people that I interview, interviewed really saw spirituality as part of, you know, part of the company culture and part of the way and, and, and a strategic way to increase the bottom line. Now, I want to back up here and I want to say that, you know, we often think of Silicon Valley as a sort of this weird outlier, right? But in my book, I want to argue that Silicon Valley, that this is not just a Silicon Valley thing, work replacing religion, but rather a generalizable pattern that we, that really I think that we see among American professionals, especially in knowledge industry hubs. I don't think we see it to such the extreme in other places, but Silicon Valley is a great experiment because, it help, because it's so extreme that it helps us see these patterns that we're seeing kind of reflections of in other parts of the countries. Um, for instance, most Fortune 500 companies have, a, have adopted the basic elements of religious organizations. They have a mission, values, an origin myth, and even a charismatic founder. Um, if you flip through any uh, issue of Harvard Business Review, there is a lot of spirituality in this, you know, in this secular uh, management magazine. In fact, um, one of I quote this um, this uh, one of um, I quote this one you know management guru who wrote an article in Harvard Business Review where he says, "Meaning is the new money." Essentially, this is, you know, good management means you need to provide meaning for your employees. Um, we also see it in like the kind of slogans uh, in corporate America, bring your whole self to work, right? And when they talk about your whole self, they're really also talking about your spirituality, you know, your spirit, your, your well, you know, bringing, bringing that spiritual element of yourself to work. Because when you bring your whole self to work, you give your whole self to work as well. Um, professionals today describe work using words like calling, mission, 
purpose and authenticity. These are words that Americans used to reserve for non-work spheres of life, right? Like your family, your faith community, your neighborhood. These institutions and spheres of life where you give your unconditional love and loyalty. So those words, those, that affect, that culture is now also being, um, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, friends, just because we're doing a, uh, this is a conversation <laughs> for you, but this is a conversation for other journalists also. And there's just a little bit of a mic issue, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm cool. sorry, my uh, hair is getting in the way. Just like okay. a podcast break. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody wants a coffee? No? Okay. Excuse me. So, so anyways, this, so this changed notion, right, of work as being a sense of vocation, calling, mission, purpose, and using these words like authenticity to describe the workplace. This is something that we've, you know, a development that we've seen, I'd say, in the last 10 to 20 years um, in, in the United States, particularly among high-skilled professional workers. Um, even the way that we talk about you know, in, in Silicon Valley, and I think this is just normal, common parlance uh, all for, for most professionals now, is that you talk about joining a company. What, you know, you think about that verb, joining, like what does that mean? We, we, join, we join faith communities, we join clubs, and now we also use that word joining to talk about working for a company as well. There's a lot, in, there's a lot of, there are a lot of assumptions embedded in that. So I argue that this pattern of work worship, it reflects this larger 45 year trend um, that we've seen in the United States and this shift in the meaning of work. And I call this the expansion of work and the contraction of religion. Um, and what we've seen is that starting in the, late 19, in the late 1970s, we've seen that educated workers, and here I just wanna I, I just want to say, I just want to point out that I'm really talking about high skilled workers. I mean, work, we, we really have, we see this sort of bipolar um, um, a, a movement in the uh, experience of work for American workers, where you see high, for, for high skilled workers, you're seeing that work is becoming more meaningful. In the last 45 years, work has become more meaningful, more fulfilling. Uh, and actually more profitable. Whereas for non-college educated workers, work has actually become less dignified, less stable, less secure, and actually they've, they've become lower paid. So we see this like really different experience of work. And I'm really talking about this, uh, 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 a small but significant minority of elite high skilled workers. Okay, so let me back up here. Is it starting in the late 1970s, we see this really, interesting pattern where educated workers, high skilled workers started working more hours. Um, and it used to be the case in the United States where if you were less educated, you were working more hours. But we're starting to see this shift in the 1970s where high skilled workers were working more and more hours. And there's a lot of explanations for this. There's large, you know, first you see the rise of global capitalism, also the rise of the knowledge economy. And for high skilled workers, work became more demanding. And this is something that we hear a lot about, I think. But there's this other part of the story that we don't hear as much about, is that as it became more demanding, it also became more fulfilling. So that in order to compete in the global economy, American companies restructured work, demanding more hours, but also may, making it more fulfilling. They gave workers more autonomy. They flattened kind of the authority structure. They offered things like profit sharing and stock options that they hadn't offered before. They invested in the professional development of workers, and they also paid them a lot more. So high skilled work became more meaningful, more fulfilling, um, and more profitable. But for non-college educated workers, work became less secure, less stable, less meaningful, and less dignified. So that's what's happening in the world of work. Work is sort of expanding. It's taking more of your time, but it's also fulfilling more parts of yourself as well, if you're a high-skilled worker. Now, what's happening in the world of civil society and um, civic institutions? We see this pretty slow and steady, but large decline in civic religious and civic participation. 
so that the non-work spheres of life that had originally provided identity, meaning, and belonging have now really contracted. And so this is where, you know, when we talk about religious participation at an all-time low right now, this is a long trend, really, that we see for the last 50 years that slowly, you know, that slowly was like declining and declining. Um, and what I argue is that these two things are related here. It's basically the sphere of work and institutions of work are taking over, if have now supplanted what Americans used to look for in their faith and civic institutions. So in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, the typical white collar worker worked 40 hours a week. Now, and then built a really fulfilling and meaning, well, built a life outside of work, okay? And this was in their rotary clubs, their faith communities, their softball leagues, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, things have changed dramatically since then. They didn't have email then, they didn't have Slack then, you know, work was also physically bounded, right? But the other thing that has changed is that in the 1950s and 60s, that you basically needed to belong to a civic institution in order to be somebody. You know, your religion, your faith really gave you a social identity, right? And today, if you're in Silicon Valley, your work gives you that social identity. So there's this really big sh this shift here. Um, and so, so that today, when I was conducting my interviews in Silicon Valley and I asked tech workers, well, where do you find community outside of work? And they would all say to me again and again, like, oh, that's a really big challenge here in Silicon Valley, finding community outside of work, you know. And so what I argue in my work, in my book, is that really, you know, we're so used to talking about work as being extractive. And we talk about work versus life, right? We have this work-life balance. And I think that this is a really um, uh, retrograde way of thinking about the way that work operates in our lives today. And I argue that work actually has an attractive force, at least in Silicon Valley, over people. It's not, yes, it does extract, but it but if we started to think of work as having extract as, as an attractive force, we might think about it differently. Like people would say to me over and over, there's no such thing as work life. It's all one big life. But from my observation as an outsider, no, it wasn't one big life. It was one big work of which life fit in. So I argue that companies are meaning-making institutions that offer the gospel of fulfillment and divine purpose in a capitalist cosmos. So I conclude in my book by talking about Silicon Valley as a techtopia. And a techtopia is an upgraded social operating system where work is the highest form of fulfillment. And whenever I talk about Silicon Valley, you know, people say, well, what's wrong with this? You know, what's not to like about this? People are living productive and meaningful lives and making a lot of money and eating good food and exercising. You know, like what, what's not to like about this? And what I argue is that, um, so I talk about, you know, in a techtopia, work is like this giant, huge, powerful magnet. And that is attracting, and so, sorry, let me back up. Say you have this table, okay? And you, and each of the different social institutions are different sized magnets that you have here on the table. And then you pour a, a, a bucket full of metal filings onto this table. Well the, well, the filings are going to immediately, they're gonna naturally be attracted to the lar largest and most powerful magnet on the table. And what's happened is that big powerful magnet has become work. It is in a place like Silicon Valley and that faith communities, families, arts organizations, other civic institutions have grown smaller and weaker in comparison. And they're like these small magnets that are just competing, right? If these metal filings are the, represent the time, energy, and devotion of a community. And so what, has, what ends up happening is that these smaller, 
institutions, weaker institutions, in order to survive, in order to compete for the time and energy and devotion of a community, they basically have to service the big magnet, which is the workplace, which is what I, which is what I observed. Um, for instance, and I saw this, and I saw this um, among religious institutions. For instance, I interviewed um, a Buddhist priest that I call um, Gil Goldman in my book. And he told me that people were no longer coming to the morning sittings or the morning meditations at his temple anymore because people were so busy working. So he got this great idea that he was going to bring meditation to the workplace. And so he decided he would bring meditation to the workplace. But in the process of bringing meditation to the workplace, he had to take out the ethical teachings. He had to shorten, you know, he had to shorten the teachings and he basically had to repackage meditation into a productivity practice, which is not just his story, but the story that I've of so many other meditation and mindfulness, yoga instructors, Dharma teachers, you know, Buddhist teachers that I interviewed, is that basically I can't make a living by just teaching at meditation centers and yoga studios anymore. I have to basically what I call get Google money. And then in order, in, in, and then in the process of doing that, you transform the religious practice. Um, I talked to faith leaders. I talked to, for instance, one um, Protestant pastor he who told me, you know, back in the day, 30 years ago, my typical, you know, my typical congregant would come uh, would attend church once a week and then stay for Sunday school. And now he says that the typical con congregant comes maybe once a month and just for Sunday service. And then he said to me, as a, as a church, we rely a lot on volunteers. And so now we are facing this volunteer challenge. So the problem with Techtopia is that it mo monopolizes, the workplace monopolizes the time, energy, and devotion of a community. And it fulfills so much of people's needs that people tend to disinvest and disengage in public and civic life. So public officials told me it's really hard to engage tech workers and that they're politically disengaged. You know, people were telling me, faith leaders, similarly, you know, it's really hard to get people to come to church or to participate in our faith institutions. Um, and so what happens, you know, when I talk about Techtopia, what I'm really describing here is an ecosystem. It's a social ecosystem where people direct their devotion to work because that's where all the material, social, and spiritual benefits of a community are concentrated, right? So it's by default that you will worship work simply because this is how the, this is how that, the system is structured. Um, I see I'm running out of time, so I'll just really quickly wrap up here. I mean, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to grapple with is this in the book, and I try to challenge my readers with is how do we not worship work? You know, how do we how do we how do we create an alternative way of working, and how do we how do we rethink the way that we work? And my answer is which I really hand off to other people, but the hint of it is we have to rethink our social institutions and we need to really build up our civic institutions. We need to build up these other alternative institutions where we can find fulfillment and purpose and meaning. So that's my book in a nutshell. I just wanna also name two things just because I am also the executive director. My other hat that I wear is I'm the executive director of the Asian Pacific American Religions Research Initiative. And since I'm with a room full of journalists, I want to just talk up, um, you know, encourage you all to um, pay more attention to Asian American religions. Um, I'll speak really briefly just about Asian Americans uh, religion and politics. Um, you know, I, I was talking about this briefly with some of the folks at breakfast this morning, but uh, whenever I'm looking, whenever I read about race and religion and politics in the newspaper, I feel like it's all about white Christian nationalism. And I feel like there's some other really interesting stories out there, particularly reg regarding Asian American Christianity that are being overlooked. Um, I, I think that some of the most fascinating shifts in American Christianity actually have to do with the growing Asian and Latino population. 
um, 25% of American Christians are people of color. Among Gen Z, that number is 50%. And this is a group whose politics, uh, whose education and demographics look very, very different from white evangelical Christianity. White evangelical Christianity, the numbers actually have been declining, um, and it's a group that is actually not growing. And so I think that, anyways, this is just to encourage you to all look at this, this particular group, because I think that this is really going to be the future of American Protestantism. Um, and, um, and in many ways, their political uh, behavior looks a lot more like black Protestants. Um, and, um, and, but what's different with them, uh, with particularly Asian Americans versus uh, black Protestants is that black Protestants have a history of their own black institutions. Um, and so the majority of black Christians actually worship in black, uh, black churches. And that's not the case with Asian Americans. Um, and so that we see that in many of these organizations, for instance, the National uh, Association of Evangelicals, that uh, Asian Americans are integrated and have risen to leadership positions there. The provost of a place like Wheaton College is Asian American. So I just want to put this out there um, to pique your interest and I'd be happy to talk more about it. Thank you. Carl. Yeah. That's great. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Frank Stevens. In the trenches. Yeah, I, I feel like you're all getting a raw deal transitioning from a brilliant sociologist to uh, a venture capitalist. Um, I think there's there's certainly a lot of, of meat here and um, things that I've seen a lot of in my 10 years in venture capital. Um, prior to being at Founders Fund, I spent six years at a tech company called Palantir that's now a little bit of a software company. So this has represented the majority of my professional life, with the exception of three years that I spent working in the intelligence community in DC, um, which was a vastly different experience uh, than the, the tech part of this. Um, I, I think like the kind of going back to your early point about the, um, the engineer, I'm assuming, from Georgia <laughs> that came to Silicon Valley and lost his faith uh, over time. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a evangelical Protestant tradition in rural Ohio. And um, I think that there's something about the way that those tradition, that I certainly experienced that tradition, uh, that I can understand how people would lose their faith mm -hmm. when they come into the kind mm -hmm. of coastal mm -hmm. knowledge worker economy. Um, and, and I'll just tell this as a personal anecdote, kind of yeah. right from there. So um, growing up, there was this idea that there was your religious life um, and then there was maybe your personal life, and then your professional life was the way that you provided for your family. So your nine to five was just, I'm working because I have to work, and if I bring my faith into my work, I'm going to bring it in in the context of evangelizing. Like I'm witnessing, uh, preaching the gospel to people around me, maybe inviting them to church. Um, but there was certainly no, no overlap between my professional life and you know any sort of spiritual persuasion or mission that was attached to that other than evangelism. And so I think when a lot of people transition out of that into the knowledge worker economy, it becomes very clear that evangelizing is going to be more difficult than they might have imagined. Maybe they weren't prepared from an apologetics perspective to approach that. Um, and so it's easy to slot something else into that meaning and purpose box. The, the place where I think this kind of uh, ha has like a very different vibe in Silicon Valley is that I think people in the tech economy want that meaning. That's mm -hmm. like a part of their compensation mm -hmm. is, is the meaning that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think actually this is the historical Christian perspective of work as well. You know, all work is sacred in some way. Um, the the co collaboration with God towards redemption for humanity is part of our call uh, as, as humans. And and so I think, you know, a, a subtle reframe around that uh, has a really powerful impact to bringing people into their faith mm -hmm. in, in a more prepared way. And you see that coming out in 
uh, probably most notably the Gotham Fellowship out mm -hmm. of Redeemer Presbyterian in New York mm -hmm. City, where uh, the whole purpose of the program, which I've never gone through in New York, I've gone through the curriculum independently, um, is teaching people about the sacred nature of their vocation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not all about evangelism, it's about what is it, how is it that what you're doing is contributing to a positive spiritual impact on the world. Um, and that reframing makes it much easier for Christians and people of other faiths that are coming into these communities to retain their faith uh, because they actually believe that it matters. That you know, if they're uh, building a social network, you know, what is what is it that you're doing that has a redemptive uh, impact on humanity? Or if you're building uh, biotech, what is it that you're doing that is part of a redemptive nature of humanity? And um, and I think that is becoming more common now, um, but it's still very nascent in the way that people are thinking about this. I think the Gotham Fellowship is probably only 10, 12 years old. It's, it's not, uh, not a very uh, old phenomenon. And that faith and work program of study is exploding in the coastal uh, communities. And you wouldn't have to look that hard to find this in like every major church in Mallettburg or County that are focused on these faith and work programs. Um, so that's the first thing I would say, uh, is that there is a, a view of this where the mission can be aligned in, in a way that is more uh, aligned with spirituality, with uh, religious spirituality. Um, you know, the, the kind of the question around uh, spiritual ec ecumenicalism and mindfulness and meditation retreats, spiritual retreats, executive coaches, yoga, um, I, I feel like that was definitely very, very popular. Um, in the five to ten year window ago range, um, it's starting to collapse a little bit, and you're starting to see a lot of the air being sucked out of the room. Um, the probably the organization that most exemplified this in the tech community is called the Effective Altruist Movement, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, it was a powerful social movement, I would say, within tech, especially like executive tech leadership. Um, uh, for, for a while, and uh, it is commonly ridiculed today in Silicon Valley at, at, due to its association with uh, SPF, as an example, Sam Bateman Free. Um, there have been profiles that have been written up on the leadership of the effective agricultures and movement that have kind of called them out in their corruption and um, uh, overall silliness. Quote that. Um, and, uh, and so I think that there's there's an increasing skepticism. Um, and what I think the like the important tie back to this that I often see when I'm talking to um, other founders in, in the tech community is that there there's a lot of ways that you can get kind of surface mindfulness. And this goes to your, your point about the Buddhist monk going in and talking to Google. Um, but there's no ethical teaching that goes along with Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. And so I think that the, there are a lot of these founders that they'll dip into this to you know, find some peace or uh, meaning for their life, and then they realize that uh, these movements are just telling them things that they want to hear. It's like culture re cultural reinforcement of individuality and of um, you know, your own worthiness, and, uh, and, but there's no truth. There's no like ethical teaching that underlies it. Uh, and so it still feels very empty. So people will go through these cycles of like, I'm going to try the whole like, you know, Buddhist yoga thing. Uh, that doesn't really work. I still feel really empty. Uh, I'm switch and they'll still feel really empty. And then eventually they circle back and they're like, okay, tell me more about this Christianity thing. Now I'm like really at my wit's end and, and want to kind of better understand this. And so uh, I, I think of the most surprising thing to me in the time, the 15 years that I've spent in the tech uh, world is that the common uh, assumption is that there's a great deal of hostility towards organized religion. Um, I've actually found that there's a great deal of curiosity about people who have kept organized religion as part of their life um, once they've entered this, this sector. Um, and so, you know, I go through hundreds of pitch meetings every year uh, at least once a week, someone will pull me aside coming in or out of the pitch meeting and say like, I read this thing that you wrote about Christianity and your faith, and can we like circle up at some later date and talk about this? Because I'm really like struggling with some stuff. And 
So I think it's less hostility in my experience, and it's been more, you know, I'm very curious to understand how someone could be in this world and still also have, have a strong uh, religious background. Um, so that, that is, uh, that, that's been a real surprise for me. Another aspect of this that, uh, uh, aside from work replacing mm -hmm. uh, people's religion, is also that their work is effectively replacing religion in some ways, uh, as in like the product that they're building is also <laughs> replacing religion in some ways. I'll give you one very clear example that aligns with the community piece of this and the loss of these other institutions. Um, online dating. Um, there used to be this kind of mechanism in society for joining these other clubs and communities, maybe going to your churches, whatever it might be. Um, and there, you could invent all sorts of reasons for why you did that uh, as a single person. I think all of us in the room would probably admit that many of those single people were doing it because they were single people. And there was an opportunity to meet other single people that might eventually end up being your, your partner. Um, today, online dating has basically made those spaces like empty. Um, and it, everyone's just sitting, swiping right. And um, if you look at the way that like pairings happened over the course of history, and I'm not a sociologist, so others in this room are more qualified to discuss this than I am, um, but you would have small local communities. And so, you know, John would pair off with Sally and Martha would pair off with Sam, whatever. And it just kind of like worked its way through because people had context. They interacted with this person, they knew their family, they thought they were charming, they thought they were smart. They thought they were funny, you know, whatever it might be. And that's kind of how, the, how these things have worked uh, over the course of history. Today, it's getting boiled down to a completely different level that's just whatever you can put on your profile that people can consume in two seconds to decide whether or not they think you're someone that they should meet. Um, and what we've seen as a result of that is kind of like a Casanova syndrome where uh, I don't know the exact percentages. There have been studies that you guys could go and pull the research on, but it's something like 60% of uh, men uh, are single, are not seeing anyone, and something like 30% of women in their 20s say the same thing. And so there's this massive discrepancy um, where there's a bunch of single men uh, who have no dating prospects that haven't uh, you know, been intimately sexually involved in a long time, and a much smaller number of women. Uh, and so, definitionally, this would seem to suggest that there are some men that have a lot of partners, and then there's this massive glut of men who have none. Um, and we look at a lot of the societal phenomena that are happening around the incel community and how that's uh, turning into violence and all sorts of uh, strange behaviors. Um, you know, I, I think this has a, a massive impact on uh, our ability as a society to sustain and thrive. And so, you know, even the things that people are building are having potentially very negative impacts on, on society in ways that might have originally been un, unexpected. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, a tendency for people to justify whatever it is that they're working in ways that um, are really just desperation and search for being filled by something, and they, they don't really know what to do with it. So this is, uh, we were talking before about an essay that I wrote um, a few months back, six months back maybe, uh, called Choose Good Quests. And um, it's really kind of a uh, very under the, under the covers uh, um, religious treatise uh, without any actual religion, um, uh, kind of expressing to people that you know, as you go out and think about what it is that you're doing in your day to day, you should think about it as a quest. Um, there's some ultimate purpose, there's something that you're working towards, um, and those quests can be good, those quests can be bad, um, and, or they can be side quests. They can be things that are like very minor that maybe don't really matter, um, and that are a distraction from whatever the main quest it is that you're on. And um, the, the call that I made in the essay uh, was that people should uh, evaluate the goodness of their quest. And I realized um, about two months later after having a bunch of people engage with me um, in random places about this essay is that our human nature is that we always assume that our quest is good. Um, it doesn't really matter 
uh, mm -hmm. uh, what your quest is. Um, everyone kind of finds a way to shoehorn their quests into a good thing. I actually had a guy at a dinner um, tell me that he was working on an NFT project and he was very convinced that this was the goodest quest that he could be on. And I just kind of scratched my head and I'm like, wow, this is not where I thought this essay was going to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so the challenge that I, that I offer to people now when, we did, when I discuss the good quest framework is let's think about all the ways in which your quest is not good. And let's like, use that as a starting point. And I, that, I think you reach a lot more interesting conversations by challenging people um, to be more introspective about places where um, they, are, they are not living up to uh, the, the value of their time and effort um, to producing something that matters for, for humanity. Um, and those conversations often have a tendency to cycle back to a more spiritual context because once people realize that there's a ton of emptiness in their professional pursuits, that leads to them searching for like, okay, then what is my meaning? What is it that I care about? What is it that I'm passionate about? And how can I redirect those energies into something more productive? Um, so I, I do th I completely agree that the whole work thing in Silicon Valley is rooted around meaning, it's rooted around mission, and uh, there's just a lot of confusion, I think, in the way that people think about those because they've been psychologically trained to just believe that it is as good a quest as any organized religion has ever been, regardless of what it is. Maybe that's a good place to Perfect. Break. Thank you very much. Right. It's great. Yeah. All right, the fun part is uh, over to you, and basically we'll keep a queue up here and get the questions and conversation going. It can be a, it can be a true question, it can be a, a challenge or a statement. Um, and uh, let's start with uh, Eugene Scott, and then Tom Hellman, and then Yair Rosenberg. So maybe Eugene Scott, you're up first from Axios. Just hit that button if you would each time that you speak. It's placing number. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your work with us, uh, Professor Chen. One thing I'm really interested in is we know that uh, the pandemic has taught us mm -hmm. in ways that we didn't know before of just yeah. how important support workers are and essential workers are, uh, even in these knowledge hubs. I, I work in Washington and despite you know how important lawmakers feel uh, their work is, these places do not run without the service staff. And I'm very interested if you had any time to speak with any of these individuals in Silicon Valley and what do they think of the tech workers viewing this space as uh, having more meaning and significance than, I don't want to say than it actually does, um, but do they, they, do they share the buy-in? Do they think these people are weird for, you know, believing in Facebook or, you know? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. I focused my research on, on the tech workers and, you know, we call tech workers, but actually the people who are working in the cafeterias are also tech workers, right? They're working for these, these, these companies as well. And they get, um, and they're treated very, very differently. So I, d I didn't spend very much time with them to get to know, uh, to get to know what their experience was. But you know, when I talk about Techtopia, um, I did talk to folks who, right, who are not working in tech, and there are collateral effects to Techtopia, meaning that what happens to when when I talk about. You know, I, I call this thing the techtopian economy, so that there is this impetus for imperative, actually, for all other service providers and companies that are not part of the tech industry to service the tech industry and to optimize the productivity of workers. So whether you're a mindfulness and meditation teacher, whether you're a restaurant worker, whether you're a dentist, like people would tell me, oh, yeah, my dentist. I can't, I, these are non-tech workers who would say like, I, I can't go to my dentist anymore because now he works for Facebook. You know, what that does is that leaves everyone else out and they get marginalized. So then what happens, so no one is servicing them anymore. So their, their, their needs, they can't afford the services or the services aren't even available to them. I mean, what I saw, and here, let me just say that I did my study pre-pandemic and tech companies were a different, they were a different thing then than they are now in that they were really looking to fulfill all of the needs of their tech workers. 
physically, you know, by providing the food, the gyms, socially, by the clubs, the friendships, the, you know, social activities, and then spiritually also by providing the meaning. And that what they would do is like, they were like, you know, like this giant vacuum <laughs> that vacuumed up all of the services because they had the they had the money basically to do that and so that they can monopolize essentially the services the time and energy and devotion of the community so that leaves a lot of people out right who can't either afford it or who are either working for these companies but they're contract workers and hey i can't go you know, I, I, I don't get the free lunch or I can't, I have to pay for the bus. I'll just use a really quick example here um, of, and, and this kind of maybe addresses a little bit of what you're talking about too, is that the faith and work thing is that I talk to pastors who are like, you know, people spend all of their time at work. And so, um, so maybe we should bring the Bible study, the prayer group, the fellowship to the workplace. So then they'd start that up there. But what would happen is that if you're a bus driver, if you're a janitor, you're a cafeteria worker, you're contracted labor, and you're working by the hour, so you don't, you're not paid to have a meaningful job. You're not paid to be fulfilled at work. You can't participate in that space. So what happens is that when you bring the Bible study to the workplace, it then needs to operate by the logic of that. And so a lot of people get left out. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm not totally answering your question because I didn't speak to a lot of these folks, but, but there's definitely, it exacerbates social inequality is what I'm arguing. I, I will say this, there, there's a big difference between big tech and small tech yes. in this mm -hmm. regard. A lot of the service workers in big tech are contractors. They're not employees of the company. In smaller tech companies and startups, they're equity incentivized employees of the business. And so they are every bit of the cult as mm -hmm. the rest of the employees are, um, at least from what mm -hmm. I've seen. Like mm -hmm. our, early on at Palantir, you know, our like, we called them kitchen ops. They were like the people that mm -hmm. made sure that there was food for three meals a day, were some of the most zealous people at Palantir. I mean, it was a huge opportunity for them to like participate in the upside of these businesses in a way that, you know, they certainly weren't expecting when they came in. Um, I think that is not at all the case at like Google, for example, like all of those are contract workers that are not equity incentivized. Tom Hellman with the Oregonian. I, I found this uh, an incredible uh, topic and I could not help but look at journalism. <laughs> because our spiritual leaders were the owners, the editors, and the publishers, and we had the quest. We, I think journalists believe we have a calling. Mm -hmm. We had that big purpose. And then your, uh, your comment, the institutions of faith are not as important. I think that's happened in the media. So mm -hmm. in the old days, and I've been in this 40-some years, we would be read and watched by high income earners, highly educated, the working people on the subways, on the buses. Where, will tech provide that new kind of glue in a community, or is it over? And what is the impact of not having? I think journalism can have a spiritual component to bind people. And the second question I had is what happens when these people retire? Mm -hmm. when they leave the church because they're too old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me start with your last question. <laughs> I think that that, I, I think that we see a little bit of this, we, we saw a little bit of this with the tech layoffs, is that, um, you know, not just when you get old, but what happens when the company lets you go, right? And and when I spoke to tech workers, you know, one of the, one of the, feelings that they expressed was one of betrayal, you know? And you kind of think about, well, wait, this is a contractual relationship. Why would you have betrayal? Not only contractual, but they had a very generous severance package to follow. And so really it's a contractual relationship, but the way, the way that the culture of work creates it a relationship that is not contractual. And so many people, they're like, this is, you know, I lived and breathed and bled Google, <laughs> you know. And so when you lose a job, you're not just losing your paycheck. You're losing 
your meaning, your identity, your purpose in life as well, everything that's wrapped into it. And so I think that when you retire, it's the same, you know, it can be a similar thing. And, and I think that what I, what I observed in the tech industry is that it's a very ageist industry and that people were, especially older workers, you know, um, um, it's that they, older workers who, who had gone through some rounds of layoffs had a very different attitude towards work that they knew that they couldn't afford that. So, you know, it's the, the recent tech, tech layoffs that happened, a lot of people who got laid off had never experienced a layoff in their life. I interviewed older workers who experienced tech layoffs, especially in the, you know, the tech bubble of the early 2000s. They had a really, really different approach towards work, but not just an attitude. And here again, as a sociologist, I want to emphasize the institutions and the connections that people made is that these older workers, when they got laid off in 2003, they got fired from their jobs. They changed their lives by actually becoming involved in organizations outside of work because they knew that I can't put all my eggs in one basket. And so that built a kind of cushion and resilience in them that I s did not observe among the younger workers. So, so that gets to some of that question. Now this question about, so I've spoken to a lot of journalists and they always like, after the tape recorder is off, you know, okay, not, we don't use tape recorders anymore, but the recorder's off, right? They'll say like, oh, actually, you know, that's not so different from journalism. <laughs> they say the same thing to me. And when I talk to academics, they all, they all say the same to me too. They say, well, we think of our work as a calling and as a, as a vocation, like how are, and, and you know, and I struggle with that question all the time because it's true. You know, I, uh, so I'm Gen X and I grew up during a time when also, that's why I'm saying this isn't just a Silicon Valley thing. We are taught, we're socialized. It's, 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 it's like this, if you are lucky enough to get a college education and to be educated, you have the privilege of thinking of your job as being meaningful and that it can be fulfilling to you, right? That's, that's, it's not just the money, it's not just the salary, but it's these other spiritual benefits that it can provide. And so, so you know, we are, we are, we are all social. I think everyone in this room, I'm just going to guess, is we're probably socialized to think this way about our work. Um, but can that the institution of work really deliver with that, I think, is, is, is one of the questions. And that here, as an academic and the journalist that I spoke to, and we were like, but we're not getting the free lunches. We're not getting the tech in the tech salaries. Like, are we? Am I stupid? Like, hey, you know, like, have I been taken? You know, actually, because I often felt like, hey, these folks in Silicon Valley, like, I'm not working so many fewer hours than them. But I don't have anyone providing my meals for me, doing my laundry. In fact, all of us should be do getting. I don't have a, you know, I don't have an executive coach. I would be. I would, have, I would be on my fifth book by now if I had all these other services, right? And all of you would too. We would benefit from it. And so yet instead, we end up kind of ridiculing and poo-pooing people in Silicon Valley for getting all of these amenities. But actually, I think that in many ways, we're not so far, we're not so different from them, you know? And many of us do rely on our work for our deepest friendships our sense of belonging and identity. I mean, I think of myself so much as an you know, as a scholar. This is one of my primary identity. Who would I be? Who would I be in this world if I, you know, who would you all be if you couldn't say yes, I'm a journalist, right? Yeah, and can I just ask Trey on a similar front, you know, um, are there ways in which your own work as a uh, practitioner uh, in Silicon Valley and conversations with colleagues to sort of encourage people to think about uh, religious integrity again uh, or anew. Is, is, does it trim the, the quest that they're on in some way? I mean, you say in the article, if it's not a good quest, you rethink it. But are, are, does, it, does it somehow, does it say, no, 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 take a day off and go rest? Or does it say, go spend more time with your family? Is it, are there ways in which the, um, uh, you know, your, your, your work is sacred mission, as you said earlier, your vocation that you're given, in some sense, by God, is a sacred task. So, so see the goodness in that. But is there also a limiting um, norm that you see actually, you know, impacting, playing out 
uh, how people you know sort of run with that that theme? Yeah, I would say that the amount of work that you're doing is not necessarily correlated to the quality of work that you're doing. First and foremost, it's like I think the idea that we have to spend 100 hours a week to like really feel driven and on a quest is kind of ridiculous. Um, you know, the Apostle Paul, for example, was a tent maker. He was very well known that he was a tent maker. The question is, is did he build good tents? I bet he actually made pretty good tents. Like he probably spent the amount of time that was required to build good tents. It'd be pretty lame if Paul was like an IKEA tent maker. That would be <laughs> that would be rough. Um, so I think uh, I think like the time versus quality thing is not necessarily uh, a piece of this. Um, but the the other thing that I would say, Carolyn, in response to like the way the that you frame the college educated thing is I don't think you have to be college educated to find meaning in your work. And I think that's why we have the problem that we have today is that we've said, if you're a blue collar worker, you have no meaning in your work other than just like going and making money for your family. That's like, that's like a failed ideology for America. Like we need, we need people in all of these economies to believe that the thing that they're doing matters. You know, Martin Luther talked about the milkmaid and like, look at the trickle down impacts of the milkmaid on the rest of society. Like you have to believe that your vocation has has a sacred nature to it, regardless of what it is. I think that's really important. Um, I also totally agree. Silicon Valley is totally ageist. There's like this doesn't get talked about nearly enough. Like it is the most obvious form of discrimination in Silicon Valley, and um, it almost like doesn't it doesn't get any airtime, which mm -hmm. is just like a really fascinating thing to me. Um, and on perks in the workplace, man, software margins, it's incredible. There's a, there's a reason that tech companies provide free food for their employees is because they have 90% margins. Mm -hmm. Journalists, mm -hmm. academics, sorry, you guys don't have 90% <laughs> margins. It's a different, different economy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yair Rosenberg from The Atlantic. So the problem with going third is that somebody always ends up asking your question, Tom, uh, asked what happens to these people when they retire, and that was kind of my question. And I would say it even more pointedly, um, which is like I'm listening to both of you talk and discussing how work in Silicon Valley and beyond the knowledge economy is replacing um, penal institutions, social institutions, and connections. And it rings true very much to me, and I've seen this in other people in my life and so on. Um, but it just strikes me as a giant ticking time bomb because mm -hmm. you can't possibly really believe that a profit driven enterprise. Um, is ever going to replace something that invests in you when it really it only cares about you to the extent you're able to invest in it, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't see value in you so unless you bring value to it. Right. Whereas organized religion can be corrupted in this fashion in a for-profit sense, but very often it's not doing that. It's about being invested, invested in the person. And no matter how old you are or frail you are or mm -hmm. lacking you are in other ways, it's supposed to invest in you. Um, and so I can't even possibly conceive how a company could ever really fulfill that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just, you know, but yet it seems to have, you know, convinced a lot of people that this is a thing they haven't thought 20 years ahead, mm -hmm. right? And people don't seem to think, what will, what will I be in 20 years? And will this, can it possibly be that Google will be actually providing for me, right? No matter how many wonderful perks they have compared to us as journalists, right? It still doesn't do the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so like, do, did you ever encounter people who were asking themselves those questions? Or was it just sort of verboten? And because you said all these people are shocked that they got laid off, they didn't even conceive of it, mm -hmm. right? Is there nobody career coaching people? They've got all these coaches. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I'm very serious. Like, do people have yeah. a future thinking thing where they sort of just assume, here's how it is, this is how it always will be? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm curious if you ever, if you were saw anyone with doubts, with religious doubts. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's, yeah. So, I mean, as I was, uh, so I, I think that when I was studying Silicon Valley, it was, you know, it had been riding this wave of success for so long and just growth that it almost seemed inevitable. I mean, even during COVID, right, all these other industries were, were declining, but Silicon Valley was still growing, and it just seemed untouchable that people were able to, in a way, it's like logically you know this is a contractual relationship, but the way it feels when you're there feels different. So that's, that's what you go by. And I think that, um, and... And again, I think that it really, it, it took, well, okay, a couple things here is that um, what I noticed is, so most of the people that I studied were not religious, but there were a, 
And, and because of that, I thought, you know, I better interview some people who are religious. So I found a small subset of people who are religious, and they actually approached their work very differently. Um, and they were less inclined to buy into the, you know, to drink the Kool-Aid. And in fact, they purposely spent less time at work. They had fewer friends at work. They didn't, you know, they were, they didn't do the social activities at work. They were very, um, they, they, they were very mindful of their time at work. They were, it was basically that they were saving their time and energy so they had time for something else. So they were less integrated in work in order to be more integrated in their communities. You know, they understood that if you bring your whole self to work that then I don't have something else, I don't have part of me to give to other, other things. So there was this really small, there was that subset of people. I think that people who, once they became parents, they also understood okay, I need to, I can give my whole self to work as well. Work is not going to completely fulfill me either. So in each of this, but in both of, um, and then older people were also the example too, um, were also an exception to simply because they had ties to other civic organizations. So in all of this, what we see is that when people feel committed to something outside of work. And here again, it's, it, has to, it generally has to be an institution, you know, that that counteracts that work worshiping default that tends to happen. And basically, you know, in my book, I talk about, you know, this question, well, how do we not worship work? And, and I argue that, well, we don't worship work. The way that we don't worship work is that we have to choose to worship something else. Um, I quote the late uh, writer and poet David Foster Wallace in my book where he says, there, okay, I'm gonna butcher his quote, but basically he says, you know, there's no such thing, there's no such thing as an atheist. We all worship something. The only difference is that we get to choose. And so I think in that quote, he suggests, well, if you're not gonna worship work, you have to choose to worship something else. So my argument is how do we create these other houses of worship? Now they don't need to be faith communities, but I think, again, if I could, underscore as a sociologist the importance of institutions. Uh, it, it can't be Netflix. You know, it can't be, kind of, when people talk about quiet quitting, it's like baking bread or knitting or sleeping or something like that. It's the institutions that pool our time and energy and devotion. It's the only way that you can create a different kind of social ecosystem. Um, so, um, so yes, there were some people who did think about this um, and who realized like this is something different. I think you know, I think, again, just because of the youth of the tech industry, people aren't thinking about, what am I going to retire? Like, it's almost like, and, you know, that's not going to happen, right? <laughs> that was this 2005 Kenyan commencement address, as I recall. Yes. We'll put that in the show notes from this little podcast we're developing okay. here uh, as well. Okay, we've got seven people on the list. Uh, Ryan, Yusra, Jack, uh, Lily, Nina, and Hal. So we'll keep it moving if we can, and we'll probably take a break in about 15 or 20 minutes for a bit for coffee and then come back and, and do one more hour, okay? So uh, first up is Ryan Strzok. Uh, thanks so much, and thanks for hitting that button. Oh, I have to hold it. Oh, my, okay. So much work. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks for this conversation. It's been super interesting. Um, uh, I think a lot of us kind of wish we had like a Monday to Friday nine to five work day, mm -hmm. but uh, that's just not a reality for not only journalists, but uh, I mean, I think most yes. professions now, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the work life is just totally stepping all over mm -hmm. the private life. Yeah. So I guess um, I'm wondering, do you see any, do you see any way that this kind of oh, yes. uh, work as religion actually could work? And if not, then is it just a matter of drawing a, a boundary with work? And um, if, if you're not in a place where you have an institution that's meaningful to you, how do you go about finding an institution that is? Trey question. Wow. Yeah. Do you want to answer that, Trey? <laughs> I, I feel like we've covered a lot of ways in which the work as religion thing doesn't work. <laughs> um, and I think all of those things are true. Uh, you know, it is a contractual relationship. People do move on, especially in tech startups, because their startup 90% of the time fails. So they have to move on to something else. And 
you know, this is uh, like what happens. Can you worship a God who died? It's like the reason that the resurrection is so important to Christian theology is that Christianity only works if Jesus is alive. When your tech company dies, there's no resurrection. It's just dead. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of like switching that has to happen, generally speaking. And I think the big tech companies are probably less oriented towards this work as religion than the others because they are so much less cohesive in their uh, community and mission. Um, like I don't, uh, when I meet people from Google today, maybe this is more the case or it was less the case 10 years ago, but like the Google people I know are not like rah-rah Googlers. They're just like, yeah, I take the stupid bus to Mountain View every day, it sucks. <laughs> um, like I, I don't, I, you don't meet people from big tech that have the same level of intensity around their relationship with their employer. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, the thing that I'll keep coming back to because I, I, I think it's like maybe the subtle difference between Carolyn and I is that I don't necessarily think finding meaning in your work is bad. <laughs> like I think that it is actually, it would be good for all of humanity if we viewed the thing that we were doing as having purpose and meaning. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a way you can take that too far, for sure. But if we reverted to this, like, we're nine to five, we do this thing, and then we go home, and we have all the, like, I don't, I don't think that's better. I don't think that, like, is the more redemptive, more aware way of doing things. Silicon Valley is bad in a lot of ways, and, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from overdoing it. Um, but I, I think the thing that they have right is that refocusing yourself on like, I have so many hours of time in my, my day, my week, my month, my year, my life, my career, I'm gonna do something with it that I at least believe matters. And I think that's good. Yeah, if I could just say really briefly, I, I also don't find it, I don't think it's bad to find meaning in your work either. I absolutely don't. I, I, I simply think that um, we need to have a diversity of institutions that give us meaning and belonging um, and, and give us identity, not just one. I don't think that work is, is equipped to, to really do that and it doesn't provide the deep truths or ethics to really guide us. Um, and as for where do you look for these institutions, you know, I always tell people, well, you can start them. You know, you, you can actually collectively start them as well. So they could be, you know, it could be as simple as a book club. It could be, um, it could be an arts organization as well. Um, it, it, these are, it could be a political organization. I mean, th there, there are so many different ways that you could create these, these you know, these houses of worship. I would actually, yeah, I completely agree. I think the, maybe the most ironic part about the tech intersection with this is that the reason that people don't do this stuff is largely because of tech products. Mm -hmm. Like I think TikTok is more yeah. dangerous to humanity than, you know, most other things that we focus on mm -hmm. as threats to our society. Um, you know, things like I mentioned before, online dating. I think TikTok is basically you know, dopamine injections for our brain that keeps us from doing more important things. Um, we're locked and loaded into these 140 character, you know, dopamine drips of information. We lose the ability to focus intentionally on long form content that provides nuance. Um, you know, I, I, I oftentimes ask people that I interview, and I'm saying this specifically because of the group of people that I'm with, every time I interview, I ask people what they read and how they consume it. And most of the people that I talk to in like millennials, Gen Z are headline browsers. They don't even read the articles. And so, you know, you guys are in this position where you have to feed them, you know, crack headlines that um, don't actually tell anything about the story and usually are leading to further tribalism and things that are bad for all of us. And so, um, and these are all tech problems. Like the tech community, for all of its obsession with meaning and purpose, are probably destroying the world. And we're all just sitting around and watching it happen. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> There's this great story that Carolyn tells in this book about somebody who gets a job in Boston at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon and is expected to be in, in the seat on, on Monday at 9 o'clock to move completely their life. And they, he willingly chooses it. Of course he does. It's amazing. It's this sense of, of, of incredible. All right, so um, we're all choosing this, of course. Uh, Nina Shapiro. Please. Yeah. 
Well, uh, just building on what you're saying, actually, Trey, it's a great segue. Okay. Um, uh, two thoughts, but one is you talk about a quest, um, you talk about purpose, about work giving you morality. What happens when that morality is questioned? Um, there's a lot of people that are questioning the, the role of tech, even inside tech. There's issues of privacy, there's issues of sexual harassment, um, there's issues of AI destroying the world. Um, how does tech, people in tech, reconcile the fact that they are no longer viewed as unequivocally good, mm -hmm. if they ever were? And that the world does not necessarily see them the way they see themselves, which is also a problem in journalism, by the way. <laughs> but um, that's one thing. And then the other thing, I think you also, well, actually, Carol, you talk about um, you can start a political organization. Well, I think there's a parallel phenomenon happening, of course, which is that politics mm -hmm. is a lot of people's religion right mm -hmm. now and mm -hmm. has not only that sense of purpose, but also has that sense of dogma. Yes. And mm -hmm. embattlement. And mm -hmm. some of the things that you know, tribalism that we don't like yeah. now, or some of you know, <laughs> if I venture to say, but you know, some of the bad parts of religious mm -hmm. religious identity and, and um, how that's manifests. So, discuss. <laughs> um, yeah, I I would have to think about that for a second. I, I I'm not sure that I would say that people in tech view their employment as bringing some sort of morality to the table. I think that internally they might have views around the morality of the thing, but I don't think anyone's like finding truth in what they're building necessarily. Well, I, I mean, certainly there's a, the, the idea of human connection, certainly mm. in the early days yeah. of building the internet, there was a lot of this is for the betterment of humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, I think to some extent, you know, in advertising and, you know, a lot of the ways that people still think of themselves, I think it's about, we're doing good things, mm -hmm. be yeah. good, whatever yeah. that was, yeah. while we no longer yeah. necessarily do it. Yeah, the, the Google tagline, don't be evil. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I think, I, yeah, I mean, I certainly think that there's like this kind of persistent belief that progress is always good. And like we should just be continuing to develop and the moral issues will work themselves out as we go along, whether it's by, you know, you know, building products in certain ways or from government regulation or whatever it might be. Um, and I think the certainly the companies that are the closest to the intersection with those very, you know, complicated ethical issues you know, hire teams of people that do research and make policy recommendations and things like that. Um, but my sense is that the company as a whole is not like wrapped up in conversations around the ethics of the things. They're just focused on like full steam ahead, we're gonna build and like we need to have an honest, transparent, you know, approach to talking about this, but it's not the thing that's like driving people. And you know, you get, like for example, um, Google 2018, I wanna say, uh, there was this kind of employee uprising um, around the Google's involvement in Project Maven, which is a computer vision program inside the Department of Defense. Um, and you know, there was all of this hubbub about it and Google pulled out of the contract, it like got all this attention. There were 5,000 people that signed that letter like 200,000 people at Google, like 195,000 people, like <laughs> didn't even think it was important enough to think about what was happening. They were just like, yeah, we're building stuff. People are gonna use it, cool. 5,000 people like signed a letter uh, about this. So, I mean, I, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm not defending this. I don't necessarily think it's good, but, um, but I definitely don't think that conversation is like, driving product decisions necessarily. Can I just say something briefly, which is that um, I, I think there's, um, there's the talk of the good, right? And, how, and how, how, the, how can you keep that up with, you know, um, um, democracy on the line? Like all these things which tech has had, an, had a hand in. And what I found is that it's, 
just how tenacious that narrative was so that people would say, well, that's not my company. You know, um, it's, it's so-and-so that's doing it. Or people would leave companies if they thought like, I, you know, I don't, I don't believe in its mission, so I'm gonna move over here and do something good. But, but what just is always surprised, you know, what I find shocking is just how tenacious that is, that, you know, I recently talked to um, some Gen Z engineers, who I think are very different actually than millennials and Gen X folks, but he was just telling me with a straight face that, you know, that his, his was a mission-driven company and they were providing cryptocurrency for refugees. You know, so right. So, so the, the 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 talk is still there, but it can often. But there's a way that you could say, like, oh, those are the other companies. Um, if I could just say something really briefly about politics, this is just I, I have no, I don't have data for this, but this is a hunch that I had, that I have, is it? Many of the red states are states that have been deindustrialized, where work is really bad. Right? These are not thri- the, the, the red states don't have thriving knowledge industry economies. And sometimes I wonder, well, if you gave those states some better jobs, some more stable, more dignified and meaningful jobs, maybe they wouldn't be so maybe, maybe they wouldn't be such extreme Trumpists. Maybe they wouldn't be so extreme in their religion. You know So again, like when I see this relationship here, work and really what you see in Silicon Valley is that work is like sucked everything up that there's no other institutions but what I think is happening my hunch is what's happening in these reds in some of these other states is that there's the absolute absence of any meaning or dignity in work so where do you find it in these other institutions and that I think might lead to religious extremism and political extremism did you say 30 years ago you wouldn't let your kid marry a person of the opposite political party? You know, uh, um, um, I'm sorry, but you, you, you know, it, it, was, it was religion. Yeah. It was a divide then, yeah. you know, and today, of course, it's the political party. Then. Yeah. All right, well, let's take a break. We've got five people on the list. When we come back, there's water and coffee. Uh, so we will resume in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Love this topic and love this discussion. So thank you for today and this morning. Um, I have two questions. So with the pandemic, we saw sort of saw you know work transitioning to mostly remote, and I think some tech companies have gone back to work sort of you know full time in the office. But I think a lot of them do like a hybrid model. Um, and what I observed, at least with remote working, it sort of you know allowed you to like interact with the other institutions in your life that you've kind of like neglected because of work. Um, so how has sort of like the pandemic and this whole remote working phenomenon affected this notion that work is religion? And I had another question as well. Um, sort of, you know, in speaking with highly skilled workers at tech companies, did you observe this even with religious minorities? I only ask because I know there's you know, a sizable like, Muslim population within like, Silicon Valley, and there's been a lot of efforts to be very accommodating of their religious needs. Um, and I'm, I'm part of some of these like, you know, um, community groups and things, and they very much still practice like, all components of their faith, even within um, Silicon Valley. So it's kind of you know, kind of curious to see how this works. Yeah, yeah those are really, really great questions. Um, so I'll start with the last one first. Um, so it, it's really it, um, um, people of any faith, whether it's you know Christianity or it's a minority faith, so long as they are involved in a faith community outside of the work that they, it has this effect of like counteracting the work worship we tend to see. Now there is increasingly a movement for. Um, companies to um, bring religion under DEI and to be more sensitive to people of faith. Um, and, um, and I, you know, just really quickly, I'm of two minds of that. I mean, of course you want people who are religious to feel comfortable and that they could be religious, you know, that they, that they could be out. In Silicon Valley, people most particularly 
um, Protestants, but also people of other faiths did not talk about religion. They were, they would talk about like, I have to come out of the closet. They, they use that kind of language. They did not feel comfortable with it. So, so, uh, you know, on the one hand, that would be a great thing, right? But on the other hand, I think that having spent a lot of time at these companies and it all comes under this whole idea of bring your whole self to work. How can people, you know, I had one HR professional tell me, well, how, um, how do you expect them to give, give their whole self to work if you don't allow them to bring their whole self to work, right? And so, I, so I'm also suspicious of the sense that of, of bringing religion into the workplace through companies because I think basically this is a way to make them more productive and engaged in the workplace, right? So there's that other side. So actually things, so I finished my book um, before the pandemic, so it's like, oh my gosh, now everything, like my book is instantly obsolete and, you know, everything has changed and it's also just changing so quickly that I can, I just kind of never know like what's the real story right now because it's just shifting all the time. And I think that as work has become remote, it is both, it is also figuratively become remote too. So the social and spiritual benefits that come with working have, are more remote because you're physically not present. And I think that, you know, what I've heard from some people is that, you know, that in addition to like, whoa, you, you can now have meetings at 7.30, right? Because there's no commute, that that can lead to burnout because there is sort of no, there isn't also that cushion of having it being meaningful. That's the thing that can push people to give their discretionary effort. I believe in it, you know, it's, you know, or my, I get to see my friends, right? So you don't have that. So, um, so I think that, so yes, I think I agree with you that it is given people, uh, because work is more remote, because work is remote, that the sort of ties of dependency have actually allowed people to open up and to get involved in different things and to pursue different things. Um, but if we look at actual religious participation and rates of religious participation, they did decline over the pandemic and they haven't come back up. So it's not clear that this has been a, this, that, that, that it has positively affected, you know, if you say count higher church religious participation to be a positive effect on religion. I, I don't know that that, that that is actually the case. But I do think, but yes, I do think that it is opening up people to, I mean, a lot of what's happened, I'd say in the last two, three years is that people are really rethinking work. I mean, you know, I feel like I see articles about that all the time in the major newspapers because people don't work remotely anymore. I mean, people because people work remotely now, right? And that things have changed. And so, and I think that Silicon Valley, which is so often been seen as sort of the um, epitome of meaningful and fulfilling and well-paid work has that that that's kind of crumbled with the with the that that image that myth is crumbled with the layoffs. So this is sort of a ripe time, I think, for asking these questions. And I don't know where we're going to land. I just don't know where we're going to land. All right, friends. We got Trey, and then we got uh, six people on the list. So we keep keep it moving. Yeah, I'll go fast. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the remote remote work phenomenon is that it's taken on a almost political tribal uh, intensity. Like people are just absolutely convinced that remote work is the future and that it's unethical to ask them to come back. There are other people that are like, remote work doesn't work. We have data that shows that it doesn't work. We want everybody to come back. Um, and like, there's, it's just like very, very staunchly on either side. And I, you know, sitting from the perspective of an investor and companies that have taken both perspectives, um, the, they have been able to at least generate data that defends both of their points fairly well. <laughs> and I would, I would, I would hazard to guess that like, there's so much nuance that's involved in this discussion about whether it's good, whether it's bad, the culture of an organization where it works, the culture of an organization where it doesn't, a type of business where it works, types of business where it doesn't. And I'm mostly just shocked that people haven't caught on to this idea that it's just nuanced. If you're like a, a if you work at a tech company and you love working remote and they say, you know, we're, we're going full back in the office, 
and you're really upset about it, well, there are companies that you can go work remote, just like go work for a company that does the remote thing. It's like it doesn't actually do anyone any good to just freak out constantly about some super dogmatic position about whether or not this is the right thing to do. And I think to, to the earlier point, I'm not sure that the, I don't have any specific data on this, but I have not seen evidence at least that remote work has led to better civic engagement because they have more time back from not commuting or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think this goes back to my earlier point that tech tools have made it very hard to do this. Mm -hmm. Like I'm assuming actually that they're just spending more time on TikTok um, mm -hmm. and or more time on online dating or whatever. And the, the stuff that powers our communication with the world is not well suited to drawing people into in-person physical community with other human beings. Um, and I think that's a huge danger to society, whether or not you're remote or not from a work perspective. Calls to mind Yair's uh, uh, magazine's piece, uh, uh, at least the title was memorable from about eight months ago called, There is an Ideal Number of Days in the Week to Work, and that number is three. Uh, I don't know that. Anyway, all right, so. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, they made the case. You stack your meetings, you know. All right, uh, let's go to L Lily Fowler, Lily Fowler from the NPR station here in Seattle. Hi. Um, I was actually going to ask about remote uh, work, too, because I, uh, I recently covered a um, Amazon walkout, right, mm -hmm. that happened here by the spheres, and mm -hmm. hundreds of Amazon employees walked out uh, because they were being made to go back into the office, not even full time like other companies have done, but just a hybrid model two or mm -hmm. three times a week. And they thought that was just outrageous and too much. And so there was a lot of, you know, I think there was some reaction like that's a little precious like really that's like if that's your biggest obstacle like you know you know you have a, you're you're lucky but when I went to the to the walkout there were you know there were people that not only wanted to spend more time with their family but talked about things like disabilities mm -hmm. yeah. and you know finally being able to deal with certain illnesses and just some like serious issues that I myself as a journalist had not thought of. So I think that's why you see some of the dogma maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so curious, I mean, to you know, Nina's question about you know, whether or not um, some employees, you know, when they realize that the company isn't all good, you know, what happens then? I think that feeds into that too. So the walkout was about both this you know, uh, return to the office, but also climate change. Mm -hmm. And so it was this, you know, mm -hmm. just backlash against Amazon in general. Like you're just you're not being good enough employee mm -hmm. employers, right? You're not being a good employer. You're not good people, and we're going to fight back. Having said that, it was a fraction of the employees who walked out. I mean, it was hundreds of people, and it looked big, but I don't know how many people are employed at Amazon, but I know it's over a, a million. lot more than that. More than over that, a million, right? yeah. Um, so. All to say, you know, I was going to, you know, do where are we heading now? You know, is this going to continue where there's going to be more kind of uh, pushback against companies, tech companies, when they aren't uh, following certain social norm norms, you know, like, uh, you know, DEI, but also be more sensitive to employees who have certain set challenges. I mean, it sounds like you all say, you know, these companies are really ageist, so maybe that that's not where we're heading, but any thoughts about that? I would say that, uh, again, big tech companies, very different than small tech companies. Um, Amazon employs a massive slice of American society, um, everything from like people working in warehouses to people that are driving the delivery vehicles to you know, people that are doing freight forwarding logistics to software engineers in Seattle and everything in between. Um, and, you know, of course, there's, there will always be things, always, in large organizations that you can complain about. And I think that I'm not, I don't want to minimize at all the complaints of the people that were part of the work walkout. I'm sure some of them are very, very real. I think there's also a tension with what are the things that they know if they talk about that journalists are going to respond to? Like, they're, they're going to pick the issues that they're like, this is going to get a story written that, makes a, that puts us in a positive light. But do we know for sure, like, what the actual motivating factor for the walk? I don't, I'm not sure. Like, I, I don't know how to frame that. 
at the, at the smaller tech company perspective, I think these things get adjudicated internally much more easily. Like, uh, you know, I'm the founder of two tech companies. One of them has about 1,600 people. One of them has 12 people. And even at that scale, at 1,600 people, when somebody is like, I have a family health emergency, I need to work remote, we're like, cool. <laughs> yeah, go work remote. Like, I, I don't know, that doesn't seem like a big deal at all. Um, I think it's when it gets to like these massive companies where like they don't have the ability to have interpersonal relationships necessarily and they issue an HR edict and like did that person go to HR and explain their situation or did they just go to the walkout? I, I don't know. These are, these are hard things to like fully understand. Um, but I do think that like I don't want to be a tech booster, but I think that tech is actually better at adjudicating this stuff generally speaking, than most other industries. Like when I worked for the federal government, I didn't even feel like the HR people like knew that I existed. I mean, I was like an irrelevant peon in their corporate training structure that like, as long as I like clicked the right buttons every six months to go through a training exercise, like they wouldn't bother me. They only got mad when I wasn't like perfectly compliant with in tech, like, there is like a more interpersonal <laughs> engagement, I would say, with, with people. That's certainly in the places that I've worked that I've appreciated. I also have never worked at Amazon, so. Uh, Jack Jenkins with Religion News Service. Um, I'm curious about, uh, just taking from some of the questions and some of the things that y'all said about how this happens, right? Because, um, you know, capitalist um, companies desperately wanting to convince workers to do everything they can to do as much work as possible. That's you know been endemic to um, capitalism since its beginning. But what you're talking about in Silicon Valley does seem fairly unique. And, and I'm trying to figure out how that occurred, right? Because in the 90s, we had um, like the, the, the great office comedies was like office space where literally like it was a tech company and they hated work so much they wouldn't like destroy a copier, right? And or, and like the other one was like The Matrix, where the main character worked for a tech company and, and that couldn't possibly be real. Rather, it's like robots and magic, right? Like that was how much we despised even working at a tech company to getting to the kind of technotopia that you were talking about. Does it have anything to do with like the rise of the tech industry and as this power center where you mentioned that quote at the beginning where we have we just have this burden to come up with this thing to change the world where that's like a real thing you mm -hmm. can do at these places. Like mm -hmm. meaning and purpose as we're defining religion here, you know, was very real in those contexts because mm -hmm. they had they had seen the impact mm -hmm. of this industry in like mm -hmm. the United States and the world. I'm just curious how we got from, you know, office space beating up a copy yeah. to like technotopia over the course of like a couple of decades. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Oh, gosh, okay, I'm going to try to be brief here. But I would, you know, and I write about this in my book, that I think that tech culture at its its origins is very religious. Um, that it, the, you know, the, you see the rise of the tech industry happening adjacent to um, the countercultural movement in the Bay Area. So it's already infused with a lot of Asian uh, spirituality and these ideas like the human potential movement, Esalen, you know, all of this, this is their, their, their in proximity and their, you know, LSD, <laughs> they're all actually all interacting with one another in the 60s. But if we even go even earlier than that, there's really fast, it's like one of the best articles that's written on Silicon Valley by Tom Wolfe, you know, from a long time, you know, in the, that's written in the 70s, and it's about the founder of the Silicon Chip, um, Tom Noyes. And he, he writes about the early Silicon Valley, um, early tech founders as largely, they, these were guys that were coming from the Midwest from deeply religious families and places. And there's this one line which um, Tom Wolf writes about in his article. And he says um, that, um, that, um, um, oh, sorry. That 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 Thomas Noyes ran. That Intel. He founded Intel. Intel was not a company, but a congregation. And so that whole sensibility, you know, bringing that sensibility of creating this kind of 
a collective that's organized around a mission and that's going to change the world. That that was, it's really deeply embedded already with the founders. And these were founders who largely came from the Midwest, again, from very deeply religious families, you know, many of whom had passed, uh, whose fathers were ministers, but then when they moved to California, they also left their religion. And so, so the this, this story starts very early on there, I think. Um, the other thing is uh, in office, I just looked this up, in office space, the company was Inatex, which was a software consulting company. And in Matrix, it was Metacortex, which was a IT services company. <laughs> I think software so services, IT services, those aren't tech companies. Those are like, they're body shops. You're getting like, you're getting compensated like cost plus for the labor. And so I think those are kind of like very boring bureaucracy jobs sitting in cubicles. I think there's something very different about Silicon Valley, which is about building yeah. something that's new, that has huge margins and potential for wealth generation. Whereas like the office space matrix thing, that's not like an equity ownership tech role. Those are actually quite dystopian. It's like working for the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> well, just really quickly also, like these engineers release that I interviewed, they really saw themselves as being, um, as being innovators and as as being uh, you know they they it was it was more than just you know providing like some service sure, yeah sure 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 uh, how about Pal Boyd uh, Deseret News editor in chief thank you the discussion's been really fabulous uh, thank you for organizing this Josh and for you two coming uh, two brief questions one. Um, how much of this, I, I want to know if you looked at, Carolyn, any uh, of the consumer-driven aspects. Certainly there's been, you know, plenty of critiques about consumerism in general, mm -hmm. the kind of ethical, uh, ethically murky territory that we all are involved in, of maybe overspending, buying things that aren't necessary, uh, exploiting um, natural resources in ways that aren't maybe healthy. Um, <clears throat> does... I've certainly noticed in, at least in my lifetime, a trend in advertising that sort of takes the edge a little bit off of consumerism for us. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's, you know, putting Gandhi on, on a product to advertise a per particular piece of tech, or maybe making sure that everyone knows how just how great for the environment X car is or, or other product. Um, is, is the move toward a more spiritual workplace um, uh, driven by us as consumers, hoping that a more ethical product, a more values-oriented product, a product that's advertised as being something beyond just a phone, but uh, but somehow is connected with Reverend Martin Luther King in an advertisement or something, that that maybe takes the edge off of capitalism or, or makes us feel psychologically that we're doing something more noble than buying something that was made in maybe not the greatest, cir greatest circumstances and, in a, uh, uh, and, uh, and that we as consumers may be sort of buying that and therefore the company is reflecting those, those values mm -hmm. and trying to create the place that can then generate that sort of, sort of product. Then secondarily, I've been reading a little bit about Roger Williams and Jonathan Clark who founded Rhode Island, who were both seen as heretics, uh, of course, in New England. And I'm curious, did you encounter any heretics? Uh, you know, these are, of course, anytime you have a religious community, there are going to be, you talked about the disillusionment or maybe faith crisis in Silicon Valley. Um, certainly we've seen some faith crises there, Theranos, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I think so, there was a mention about another, uh, the, the, the fall of, uh, of uh, the- uh, FTX. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, there are these sort of faith crises. Are there any heretics, like any figures that you encountered. So my dual question is the consumerism question and then the heretics question. So yeah. So along the hair, I'll answer the heretics question first. Yeah, there are definitely people who who left, and um, and surprisingly, many of them went to graduate school <laughs> and, and decided like I'm going to leave the industry. Other others went to you know different left tech and went to different in industries. However, I just want to point out that. When they said this, they would say something like, well, this is more meaningful to me. 
So here, that narrative of work as meaning is still intact, you know, and I think that that is, I, I think that that is still going to, has this, is, is still here to stay, is what I'm saying, you know, that we need to have, we need our work to have meaning and purpose. Um, and then the- uh, Eleanor Kilbanoff from the Texas Tribune. Um, I'm just curious that the uh, sort of political implications of a lot of this, uh, we were just talking during the break about, you know, I'm based in Texas. Um, there's like a whole, you know, there's a lot of people in Texas who uh, sort of ha are college educated, they work very good jobs, they make a lot of money, they remain very invested in their faith communities and very politically active on like the local level and are having like huge political implications in Texas by running for school board and sort of doing a lot of things that it's in Silicon Valley and other sort of these like knowledge hubs we're seeing less and less of. I'm just curious whether you see that sort of mapping over political parties um, or what the like implications of that is. Because I actually you have... say specifically in the book uh, mm -hmm. from the, the Pew mm -hmm. data in 2014 that Silicon Valley is the lowest with 35 percent uh, religiosity. Yeah. Borrow. But mm -hmm. you know, but if you compare it with Dallas, if you compare it with Washington, if you yeah. compare it with New York, that there are different levels, and there's yeah. why? What? There's it's more than just it's more. Than, there's there's something about broader cultural norms and please. Excuse me. I, I will say this though, the new CEO of Y Combinator, which is like the most powerful tech incubator in the ecosystem, Gary Tan, is an Asian American who's a Christian, who's running the political action committee that is responsible for. Chesa Boudin and the Board of Education being recalled. So all of those things mm -hmm. actually just fit with Gary Tan as well. Um, he's a moderate Democrat. Um, so I, I think that like the, the one unifying thing of the religious communities in tech, and this goes across, like I was talking to Yair before about, I'm friends with Ari Lam, who's uh, been doing a bunch of stuff with tech. Uh, he's he's a, a rabbi. Um, uh, and you know Gary uh, at Y Combinator, like we actually do kind of want things to get better. I think like people from a faith, faith persuasion tend to like look at the world and say like this isn't good. I want it to be better, um, and we do a much better job. I think at like unifying an in interreligious dialogue as well, um, which uh, maybe will have more of that political engagement as well um, at longer term. But I think it's still really early. Certainly in San Francisco, it's still really early. I think people are just now waking up to like, this isn't what we want the future to look like. Uh, well, this was just my experience and what from the interviews that I conducted with um, community leaders and public officials is that, you know, these tech workers, they, they're, they're very politically disengaged and disinvested. Just one example is, for instance, the lack of, um, political will to do anything about the public transportation system in the Bay Area because all these tech workers, they get to, their, their commu they, they don't have to use the public transportation system, they have their own Google, you know, they have their own buses. So, um, you know, things have changed now because not as many people are going into work, but, um, but, but this, is, this, is what, uh, this is what political leaders and public officials were telling me it's very, very hard. And they said it's not, it's not that they're young, it's not that they're millennials, people from other industries are engaged, but it's particularly tech workers. I will strongly disagree with that, yeah. actually. I don't think it's because they don't care. I think mm -hmm. it's because they cannot make anything change. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Bay Area government is so dysfunctional that it doesn't matter how much effort and money you put into it, mm -hmm. nothing ever gets fixed. Mm -hmm. And so like there's all of this high speed rail conversation that tech people have put tens of millions of dollars into. There's, you know, the immigration reform stuff that Zuckerberg raised like a hundred million dollars to do work with, and nothing ever happens. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, this is why London Breed is like screaming at supervisors in the Board of Supervisors meetings. It's mm -hmm. like the whole thing just, it doesn't work. I don't know what, what's going on, but like the whole thing is just broken. And I think that tech people's disengagement is because it's just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren Gustis with uh, Salt Lake Tribune. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Trey, this question is for you. I'm wondering as an investor, how much 
credence uh, or how much water does the quality of the quest carry for you as you evaluate a potential investment or a company or a leader? Uh, quite a bit. I, I think um, you know one of the coolest things about being an investor is that, like you guys actually, I think this is maybe the coolest part of your job too, you would have to tell me, uh, I get to learn all day about stuff that I don't actually know a whole lot about. I'm not an expert in really anything that is being pitched to me on a daily basis, and that's pretty fun, actually. Um, and so I think you can kind of get a sense fairly quickly from a founder about like alignment with mission, um, which is oftentimes like one of the key indicators of the goodness of a quest. Um, if there's really bad alignment and it's like what I would call like a whiteboard founder, they just like walk up and write 100 ideas on a whiteboard and then they pick the one that's the least bad and then they're like, and on, on we go, monkey JPEGs. Um, when somebody like has deep life alignment with the thing that they're doing, they have a ton of passion for it, they're able to articulate what the, like, the long-term vision is, like is there a positive correlation with future outcomes of, at scale? And by the way, there are a lot of companies that like, if you just think about like what happens if this really works, it looks much worse <laughs> at terminal velocity than it does uh, early on. Um, I think those are the sorts of things that really get me excited as an investor. And this is, by the way, why we're called Founders Fund, is that we believe that you're investing in people rather than ideas, generally speaking. Um, and so you want to really hammer in on like, why is this the quest that this person has chosen? Um, and having a clear answer to that is, is really important to the investment decision. Um, I did a horrible job earlier in not naming that. If you, if you have a question, you will mind just putting your, your um, table tent up. That'll be an easy way to sort of nudge it if we want to keep this, this, this going a bit. Um, can you tell us just a little bit, maybe while it's happening, uh, Trey, about Palantir and Sol? Like, which company has 1,600, which, which company has 12, and uh, what, is your, what is your work in the defense space mm. like? Uh, I think this is interesting to a group like this. Uh, well, Palantir is a publicly traded company that I'm no longer involved with. Um, I don't mean Palantir, yeah. the other one, uh, the, the cool so one. So Anderil, Anderil, Anderil is Sorry. the defense tech, tech company I started. Um, that's 1,600 people. Um, we started in two, 2017. It's actually in Orange County, very close to, I'm assuming, where you live. Um, and that has been really interesting. Um, there's obviously like a lot of ethical conversations that we need to have internally about autonomous uh, warfare. Um, and you know, we've, we've deployed kind of all over the world. Right now we have uh, tech in Ukraine, um, both in the counter unmanned system side of things as well as the unmanned system side of things. So uh, drones, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, there's, there's probably like a more specific way of navigating through that, but maybe we can just move on to Seoul and we can come, come back to that if you guys want. Um, Seoul is a uh, wearable e-reader um, and it's not, I'm, I'm not pitching this as like, this is like better than Apple's Vision Pro. In fact, that's not what we're doing at all. Um, a lot of the reason that AR, VR hasn't really caught on is because we've reached the limits of physics. Um, there's only so much you can do with optics. There's only so much you can do with resolution. There's only so much you can do with tracking. Um, and to get to general purpose AR, this like vision of like putting on a pair of, you know, sunglasses and like having your entire computer in front of you is like not close actually. Um, and so the question is, what are the single purpose uses that in an ideal world you would take to improve uh, your life in a meaningful way? And I think for me, the only place that I could really come up with a good answer to that was with reading. Um, because um, this is a, a dopamine machine and I recognize that it's very bad for me. And so I've made very conscious efforts to uh, turn off connectivity, to limit notifications. Um, I have no social media apps on my phone. That's very intentional um, because I don't want to spend four and a half hours a day 
on my phone because I think that there are better ways that I should be spending my time. Um, and so our brains have been chemically rewired and we can use new hardware to force a rewiring again to get back to the place where we can uh, do more long form, highly nuanced content uh, consumption. Um, and we can do that with a lower end technology rather than something that breaks the ceiling of existing physics. So we're just using like a simple e-ink uh, display behind a pancake optic stack, um, super long battery life because it draws almost no power through the e-ink displays. And uh, you effectively get a candle that's just projected in front of your face. Um, so the most common use case with the users right now is they're just laying in bed. So you lay down, you're totally flat, you're in whatever position you normally sleep in, you have a pair of sunglasses on, and you read. And that's it. That's the company. <laughs> Love it. It's fun to read these people, but just think about reading it through soul. You know, uh, they're, 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 they're peaked. Yeah, I mean, I actually have one. I can show you what it, what it looks like. Um, it's, you know, like the Vision Pro is like 400 grams, so it's really heavy, like, and it only has a two hour battery life, so it, it ends up being like not super comfortable to do anything long form in, but I mean, this is literally just a pair of sunglasses. It weighs less than 100 grams, you put it on, and I have a book right in front of me right now. <laughs> um, so I sit on the airplane, and you know, in the first 30 minutes when everybody else is, you know, sitting there, you know, doing whatever they're doing, I just throw on my glasses and I'm off to the races, <laughs> just reading my book. <laughs> so that's it. Feel well, free to drop by for a demo if you'd like. And, and thank you for being part of the first product placement, Faith. <laughs> 44 <laughs> sessions. Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's actually the first, the first company or product that I've ever been part of building that was not intentionally trying to like level up technology in a meaningful way. And so whenever, you know, I, the, my co-founder at Andrew was Palmer Lucky, who was the inventor of Oculus, the virtual reality company that Facebook bought. And whenever I show people demos of this, um, their reaction is not like, oh, this is going to change the world. They put it on, they're like, oh, it's like a, it's like a face Kindle. <laughs> or like, if you are afraid of lit litigation, maybe a Facebook. <laughs> it's, there's really, there's really not a whole lot else to it. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, Dustin Gardner with the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in the aspect of this um, in terms of how tech migration to some of these coastal cities changes the institutions and the cultures in those in those cities. Um, in, San, in San Francisco, you know, we've lost about 8% of, mm -hmm. of the population in the last couple of years. And I think the average San Franciscan is actually happy about that because mm -hmm. it is predominantly tech people that are leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, the national media looks at that and they think the sky is falling, but people in San Francisco are glad. Yeah. Um, and it, I was talking to a woman on Saturday, I was covering a Juneteenth festival in the city, and she was passing out flyers for her church. And it's one of the oldest black churches in the city. Um, and she, you know, she was telling me how in her lifetime, like the congregation has been decimated. Um, and it really is because a lot of the community was pushed out. I mean, 13% of San Francisco was African-American. Now it's 5% mm -hmm. in the last 30, 40 years. Um, so I'm just curious to hear, what, hear your thoughts. What do you make of that sort of lasting impact on institutions within these communities that do have this big influx of techies who aren't engaging with the community the way people have traditionally done it in, in some of these places? Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that you just talked about it right there, right? You gave a great example of these, these institutions that they are, that they're, they're simply declining. And, um, and I think that, um, and I think, you know, what Trey says that people instead are relying on social media and on technology to create what I feel like are approximations of communities and institutions, um, but that can't do the real, the same work as a brick and mortar, you come together and you collect, and you're here in this one space together. I mean, I think that there is, <laughs> You know, with the move to technology, and I'm also thinking about those glasses that you're that you, what are what are, the, what are they called? Soul readers. Soul readers, yeah, is um, sort of what we lose is also sort of material materiality, 
right? The materiality of a book, the physicality of meeting in person. And there's this sort of um, a, um, a what you, you can't capture the energy of Zoom doesn't Zoom doesn't appro it approximates this, but there's there's something that the energy of you know sociologists call it collective effervescence. There's something that happens then when we're all here, and that I think that any faith leader also knows too that there's a certain kind of energy and focus that you have that can create a kind of collective will and power that you don't have that's over the airwaves or over technology. So. Um, so, so let me just also say that I think that there are, um, I mean, I think that there is a move towards institutions like creating collectivities, but that less thinking about them as lasting forever, right? They're more ephemeral. And I think that that is more of what's happening now. I don't have a really good grasp on it yet, but I think that this is really what we're seeing with, especially with Gen Z, is like these ephemeral things. And so if you kind of, let me just give you a quick example of, like Black Lives Matter as a movement versus a civil rights movement. Civil rights movement very much embedded in institutions that had this kind of longevity that could last, you know, that lasted over many years and that you could call people in to come. Well, Black Lives Matter over, over Twitter, you know, do you have the day off? Okay, I have the day off, I can come in. And, and I can be there for this big rally, but what about all the small movement building stuff that, you know, that, make, that means like you have to, do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's, not, that's not gonna build the movement, that's not gonna build an institution, but it's kind of more of this ephemeral thing that's happening. So I, I think that there is, you, you know, people are getting together, but it may not be creating the kinds of powerful institutions that I think that that you know that that we used to have. I, I'm concerned that like part of the rewiring of our brains is like kind of a fundamental unseriousness about serious issues, and I think this is like one of these where like tech is not beyond reproach. Like we do a lot of stupid things, and you know, Theranos and FTX are probably like very public ones, but it's the less public ones that are probably more concerning. But like, you know. The housing situation in San Francisco, like that is a highly complicated issue that has very little to do with tech. It's like Prop 13, it's housing codes, it's the Board of Supervisors not approving new construction, basic supply and demand economics. And like we get into these tribal things where we just throw garbage at each other and pretend that we're having a serious debate. But I don't think I, we're not having a serious debate. It's like the most unserious conversation imaginable about this. Like if we want to fix it, we can fix it. Does anyone have the will to actually do that though? I don't think so. And so when people leave the city, it's like, who's to blame for that? Uh, sure, tech is an easy stalking horse. Like let's blame Google, I'm all for it. I hate Google too, but like, like come on. Like, can we be more serious about that? Not to plug it too hard, but we had a wonderful talk from Yuval Levin on this subject uh, with a group of uh, uh, under 35 journalists a month ago that we turned into a podcast. It's 25 or 30 minutes long. It was very compelling. It's very interesting. It's very, you know, how performative we've become, how soapbox, how platform oriented we've become, especially in Congress. I really want to have real conversations, serious conversations about real issues without this being a ridiculous tribal shit throwing contest. It's unbelievable. Like, how are we not talking about Prop 13? I mean, that, it's like, it's ridiculous. It's been 50 years of this. Warwick Sabine from Interfaith America, previously in office. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering if you could compare and contrast the phenomenon that you've described in Silicon Valley with the decline in religiosity that's happened in other places previously, and I'm thinking, you know, Western Europe, Scandinavia after World War II, Japan in the 1980s and ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are probably similar through lines there, but um, how much of this is a uniquely American phenomenon, our relationship with work, uh, our church going sort of socialization versus, you know, these sort of bigger forces that have been at play globally? Yeah, oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. I feel like that's another book. Um, um, 
But it's like got to be like a four minute book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll just give you the pick those glasses and you can just put on and you can read it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this whole, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the. Um, okay. So I, I yeah, I think that work occupies a different place here in the United States. I think this is a very distinctly American thing. I think it has to come also, it comes partly from our Puritan Protestant culture and the Protestant work ethic, um, and also uh, the fact of having a much weaker welfare state um, and not having a state church. So th th these are some of the major differences between I'm trying to fit this into four minutes, okay? <laughs> but but um, because we see, I mean, secularization and the rise of religious nuns really happened much earlier in Western Europe um, and, and also in Japan versus the United States. Um, and so um, I think that, and that in many ways, the the religiosity of the United States has always been distinctly American, peculiar really for any Western industrialized country. Um, so I think that we have to remember that just starting from the get-go, very, very different kind of, the role of religion played a very, I mean, in Western Europe, religion was an arm of the state, whereas in the United States, we, um, uh, re religion was always, you know, independent of the state, and some might say a check on the state, in fact, you know. Um, and so I think j just starting from very, very different places. And so let me just back up here and say that, look, even though religious participation is declining in the United States, still like 98% believe in God. You know, and many people still maintain very religious and spiritual beliefs, even though their social behavior, their patterns of belonging. So what's changing is the institution of religion. In a place like Western Europe, you don't have 99% of people believing in God. You know, you know, you have a very low rate of religious participation, but also very low rate of religious and kind of the religious beliefs. So those are kind, kind of go hand in hand together. So what I think the transformation that we're seeing in the United States is really, I think, a shift in the place and meaning of different social institutions and where people are looking for that belonging and meaning and identity. I think that is a very different case from Western Europe where in the first place, the state church wasn't necessarily providing that. It was it was compulsory, you know, so it wasn't providing that same kind of, you know, religion is also always operated as sort of voluntary organizations like this clubs in the United States, not so in, in Western Europe. Great. Uh, floor's open. Please. Excuse me, I'm so sorry, Isabel. Isabel Ong, um, Christianity Today. Thank you for driving up. Okay, my question is um, relating to time. I think we've been talking about time a lot um, and technology and its relationship with time and, and work, like time, technology, and work. And how do you think um, this understanding of time has evolved um, mm -hmm. over, because of you know, in, in the tech space, like how that, you know, that has um, compressed time in some way or has it expanded our time? I feel like it's both and, but yeah. So what, what tensions, you know, have, have you come across, Carolyn, in your research and in Trey as you work as an investor? What is it about time that, you know, has its definition changed? Has its, mm -hmm. our understanding of it changed? And yeah, how does all that come into play <laughs> in, in, what, in work, I guess? Do you want to go first? Because I think about I, I think about this question a lot. It might be my second book. I'm going to talk a long time. I can talk forever. So. <laughs> well, then please. I am way more uninformed. I'd rather hear what your second book is going to be about here. Yeah, I mean, I because yeah, I actually um, I or not my second book, but my next book. Yeah, I, I think a lot about time um, and the influence of work on time. And then as you talk about tech products, basically we've come to think of our time as a commodity now, right? And that's the way that our work makes us think also about our time, that we have to be, that we need to optimize it. We constantly need to be optimizing it. We need to be productive um, for tech companies. Our time is commodified because they're, 
our, our time is their money. So they're always trying to get our attention. And so I, um, and so I think we have a very different experience of time today because, uh, because of our economy, because of these industries, because of these powerful institutions like work, which control our time and which make us think about time in a certain way. And basically, I think that we think of time in this way that it is like, you know, in the hourglass, that it's always running out, that it's always a deficit, that that is not, and we think about time as a resource. And I think that there are so many, and here's the religion part that comes in, and you know, when I think about the next book that I wanna write is, I'm really interested in thinking about um, how institutions, religions, cultural traditions can create different and alternative experiences of time. So if you ever go into a, if you go into a religious service and say it's not a boring one and you're into it, um, there is a sense, so rituals shape our experience of time. And there's a way that time feels different when you are in a particular, you're in a temple, you're in a synagogue, you know, you're in a church. And the way that you experience that time, it becomes, we almost see, we almost don't have the vocabulary to talk about different experiences of time, but one is fullness. How can you experience time as full, like the fullness of time, um, that as time as rich rather than as a resource that's sort of like flattened and kind of uh, constantly being depleted, right? And so there are many religions provide these experiences. I mean, one very obvious one is the Sabbath. Um, it's, you know, um, Abraham Herschel writes about it as the architecture of time. You know, how do you create, how do you create a different experience of time? And I think that this is, yeah, yeah I mean, I think about this a lot because I think it very much shapes who we are as people. And I think it's also because I struggle with it so much. I'm always like, oh my gosh, how do I optimize my time? I have all these different lists, of things that I need to do. And I realize how much of this sense of time, this logic of time that's in, that has been socialized into me because of the institutions that I belong to, how they completely control and dominate me. Um, and so, so yeah, I think about, so essentially I would boil it down to, you know, capitalism and time. How does, how has capitalism really captured our, and com completely dominated our experience of time? And I'm always curious now is like, what are these, what are these like alternative spaces? What are the practices? What are the institutions and traditions that we can draw from that give us this little respite? from like, oh, I was thinking about optimizing, <laughs> yeah. I would call our attention for what it's worth to this talk that Jean Twangy gave here uh, two years ago, roughly today. It was when Frances Haugen went to, to testify against Facebook, so that was all in play uh, from earlier. And, and she just talked a lot about how, you know, with the rising generation, a lot like John Haidt, you know, just the sort of glowing rectangle and the pull that it has, especially if you're a teenage girl but if you're a teenage boy as well, her own kids, um, you know, is, is new. And whether you're talking to Siri as a conversation partner or chat GPT, or, it, it, uh, there's something happening that's new. I mean, hopefully, uh, Trey's great, 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 great granddaughter can go back and find this conversation, except for the part off the record, you know, <laughs> and learn about her grandfather. Like, it is, it's crazy, you know, how that is bending and changing. And, and I think it's actually getting worse, too. Like, Algorithmic video is short form algor algorithmic video is significantly worse than what we had even a couple of years ago. <coughs> TikTok is significantly more addictive. It draws people in much more, yeah, feeds people exactly what they want to see. And so it tends to lead to longer sessions. Yeah, I think. But the kids in China think it's so cool that when you get on the bus, you can just swipe your little iPhone and. Well, the biggest difference is that kids in China get education videos fed to them on the Chinese version of the app. Our kids do not. <laughs> so hmm. you can ask all sorts of questions about that. <laughs> yes. can I, Warwick, please. Wait, it's funny, so the, the whole time we've been talking, I, I was expecting or anticipating that like the, the metaverse would come up. Um, 
and sort of the almost the zealotry of Mark Zuckerberg and the fact that you know he's kind of stuck with this idea even when you know he's losing money he's making his shareholders really upset um, there's no guarantee of success with it um, but he's you know really stuck on it he renamed his company obviously uh, as a result of that and so to me it embodies a lot of these things that you're talking about in terms of and, and again I didn't I didn't have a question about it I've just been thinking about it the whole time but it, but in terms of uh, capturing people's time, of creating an alternate reality, of giving meaning, of also, it seems to me there's a there's an element of people being very unsatisfied with the world as it is, and it would just be better if I could be in this alternative reality that I've <laughs> created, or I can control the elements of. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, I, I, again, like I said, I didn't have a fully formed question about this. I've just been thinking about it and surprised that it didn't come up, because it seems like the next iteration of what you've been talking about in terms of what Silicon Valley has been doing vis-a-vis -vis sort of religion, faith, spirituality, belonging, mm -hmm. identity. I mean, is, is that inevitable? I think we're a long way away. Okay. Um, getting fully immersive VR right is more than just building a really good headset. There's haptics that are involved, like can you actually feel the things in the environment? There's locomotion issues, like can you actually walk? Um, there are like weird things with omnidirectional treadmills where if you're going like at a full full speed walk and you stop, there's a, a lag that creates this like disconnection with uh, the reality, the virtual reality that you're in. Um, and so uh, we're not close on omnidirectional treadmills, we're not close on haptics, the headsets still weigh over 400 grams, way too heavy, battery life is limiting, they put off way too much heat, which hurts your eyes. We're nowhere close to neurological inputs. Neuralink is the furthest along and they're still decades away from doing anything with like actual BCI. Um, I guess I'm not concerned because the technology is not, not close. I don't know if you spent like an hour in an Oculus headset, but that's about as much as you would ever want to spend in an Oculus headset. You're not going to like to put your whole life in there. AI, of course, is like a much more real conversation. You could have a conversation about how faith and religion intersects with AI. Like what is the meaning of being human in a world in which there are um, human-like actors operating in our, our homes and our relationships and things like that. Um, but I think we have literally zero minutes left. So I'm glad that we dodged the bullet on having to talk about AI. <laughs> All right, that was close. Well, please join thanking Carolyn and Trey. Thank you.